from Unity Church of Christianity in Houston, Texas. This is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational Christian church providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress with the Rev. Howard Caesar. So a woman was at her hairdresser's getting her hair styled for a trip to Rome with her boyfriend. And she mentioned this trip to the hairdresser who responded and he said, Rome? Why would anyone want to go there? It's crowded, it's dirty. You're crazy to go to Rome. How are you getting there? She said, well, we're flying Continental. We got a great rate. He said, Continental? That's a terrible airline. Their planes are old, their flight attendants unfriendly, their flights are always late. Where are you staying in Rome? And she said, well, we're at this exclusive little place on the river, and she told him the name of it, and uh, he said, oh, no. I know, I know about that place. Everybody, everybody thinks it's going to be special, exclusive, but it's a dump, you know. It's the worst hotel in the city. The rooms are small, the service is terrible, and they are overpriced. So what are you going to do there in Rome? <laughs> We're going to see the Vatican, and we hope to see the Pope. He says, you and a million other people. <laughs> He'll look the size of an ant. Good luck on this lousy trip of yours. <laughs> You're going to need some. So a month later, she comes back. She's been on a trip. She's back to the hairdresser again, and the hairdresser asked her about her trip to Rome. And she said, it was wonderful. Not only was uh, the flight on time, but we got a brand spanking new plane. And uh, it was overbooked, and they bumped us up to first class. The food and wine was wonderful. There was a 28-year-old flight attendant who waited on me hand and foot. And the hotel was great, too. They had just finished a $5 million remodeling job, and now it's a jewel. Finest hotel in the city. They, too, were overbooked, apologized, and gave us the owner's suite <laughs> at no extra charge. The hairdresser muttered, well, that was good, good, but I know you didn't see the Pope. She said, well, actually, uh, we were quite fortunate uh, because as we toured the Vatican, there was a guard that tapped me on the shoulder and explained that the Pope likes to meet a few of the visitors <laughs> every once in a while, and if I would like, I could step into this room on the side and that he would personally come eventually and greet me. So five minutes later, the Pope walked through the door, shook my hand, I knelt down, and he spoke a few words to me. What did he say? He said, where did you get that lousy hairdo? <laughs> I hear revenge in that laugh. <laughs> so today, today I want to talk about buying and selling, <clears throat> and that in every person's life, and throughout their life, they are forever buying and selling. And really what we buy with our dollars is really not nearly as important as what we, do, what we buy with our minds and what we buy with our heart. You know, we buy ideas, we buy opinions, we buy concepts, and these basically are the factors that mold and shape our life. They mold and shape our values, our perspective, our outlook, our consciousness, and they shape our lives. And I think we have to ask ourselves, well, how much uh, light of the light of God do we allow to shine into some of the things that we buy? And buy, I'm talking about internally, not just externally, you know. If thought is really creative, and thought is creative, that's been established scientifically, that every thought carries an energy with it, that we are creating our reality through our thinking and dominating thought, um, then our thoughts really do affect the experience that we have of this life based on what it is that we have bought into in terms of our beliefs and our ideas and opinions about life. And it's been said that selling is the art of persuading others to want something more than what it will cost them. Okay? 
And that de definition applies not only to things that are tangible and physical that we would buy in our world, but it's really talking about intangible things that, as well. I mean, even when you buy, uh, let's say, insurance or life insurance, you're really trans it's a transaction of paper. And what you're really buying is a state of mind. You're buying a state of mind that brings or carries with it a certain amount of peace that things will be taken care of um, once you depart. It's been said that the key to successful selling is realizing that you are basically selling a state of mind. That's what you're selling. And that's all you really can sell uh, is a state of mind or belief. That the thing, whatever it is that you're wanting to sell, will prove, prove to be more useful and to be more valuable than whatever the sum of money or whatever it is that you're exchanging with it. And so what is sold basically comes down to a belief, not necessarily a thing. And we all recognize that through radio and TV commercials and various things like that, that um, they're really selling a belief or a state of mind. They aren't selling soap or perfume. You know, they're selling the belief that that soap or that perfume is going to make you cleaner, make your, soft, your skin softer. It's going to you know, make you more fragrant, uh, more appealing, more attractive, make you feel better about yourself, whatever. There's something that's being sold, which is a state of mind, essentially. And so what we buy is really the essence of usefulness of a thing, because we can't really know its usefulness until we have actually begun to experience it. So we buy something, and then we find how useful or not it is on the basis of our experience of it, OK? So we have to distinguish between, really, in life, what's useful and what's not useful. You know, it's just like food. We buy, we buy food. You know, go to the grocery store, and there's all this stuff on the shelf, and we have to decide and distinguish what's useful and what's not. And so there are those things that we buy that are nutritious, that we know are nutritious. Uh, we've learned that they are. They, we've experienced that they generate energy and um, fuel for us. And then we also have the choice of the other kinds of food, you know, the Cheetos and the Fritos and uh, what gets labeled uh, the junk food kind of thing. And so, you know, we have to make that distinction. And the same principle, really, is what feeds us in our mind and heart. What is it that we're buying uh, off the shelf in all the different areas of life? We've been sold ideas about life from the time we were born, really, and learned the language we spoke. Um, basically, we are told by all of those who have been around us through life, uh, well-intentioned, certainly, the things that we've learned and been told about uh, by our parents, by our siblings, our friends, our neighbors, uh, teachers, ministers, you know, on and on. And maybe we didn't buy all of it, but we certainly bought some of it, and some of it was valuable, some of it was useful, and uh, yet some of what we bought into along the way uh, was somewhat disempowering. Some of it was not necessarily constructive, not necessarily useful. And so every one of us have bought into ideas about ourselves, and we're still buying into ideas about ourselves. They create our self-image, our sense of identity, what have you. Every one of us has bought into ideas about life, some useful, some not necessarily useful. Every one of us has bought into ideas and beliefs about relationships, some useful, some not. Every one of us have bought into ideas and beliefs about death, some useful some not. Every one of us have bought into various religious beliefs and concepts, some useful, some not. And every one of us have bought into various ideas and concepts about God, about Jesus Christ, some useful, some not. I couldn't buy in when I was growing up, and I was uh, fairly young. I couldn't buy the idea that a person was born in sin. And that's just an idea or a concept that I couldn't buy. That before you've taken your first breath, you're already somehow uh, guilty of something. Some of you perhaps have you know, had those kinds of things too. Um, I also could not buy the idea that some said that if you're not Christian, you're going to hell. I couldn't buy that. I couldn't buy into a God that was like that, that we're all a creation of God. And so there are various things, and you could think of those that are yours, that you didn't buy into and uh, for whatever various reasons. And Jesus gave us kind of a rule of thumb uh, when we're assessing you know, what to 
accept what's useful, what's not useful. And the way he said it was simply, by their fruits, you shall know them, by your, their fruits. And we're not just talking about the quality and the character of a person. We're talking about the quality and the character of any thought, any idea, any concept, any belief. Does it feed you? Does it energize you? Does it give you life? Does it feel right? Does it resonate within you as a spiritual being? Or does it somehow drain or deplete or take away? And we all have that capacity to feel our way and to know the truth, because the truth will set you free. In other words, it sets free these life energies in you uh, that, f that feel like you're, you're connected uh, to others. And so the whole idea here is that, is it useful? You know, is it productive? And is it constructive? Very important. The nature of God, we say, is good. The nature of God is good and goodness. And that means useful, constructive, uh, valuable, empowering, all of those things. And we should always ask the question then, is this useful? Is this idea that's being introduced to me, is this thought or concept one that is empowering? Does it have light and love in it? Uh, is it something that I really want to buy and believe in? In the world, you will always have put in front of you for sale to buy a variety of thoughts, opinions, ideas, and beliefs, and concepts all through life. It doesn't stop. It doesn't cease. It's always the opportunity to learn more and to know more. And so there will always be more of these perspectives and ideas and opinions, religious concepts as well. And some of them need to be left on the shelf. And some of them you will know to embrace. But that's a continual journey and an unfolding uh, in every person. Some of you are familiar with the name Ogmandino. Ogmandino was a dear friend of mine. Uh, he, he came to this ministry a number of times to speak. Um, he wrote books in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, some of you are familiar with his writings. He passed on in the, in the 90s, and um, he just a beautiful soul and author. And anyway, uh, he had like a trilogy of, of books, many books, but uh, a trilogy that had to do with the greatest this, the greatest that in the world. And so he wrote a book called The Greatest Secret in the World. He sold over a million copies. He had a book called The Greatest Miracle in the World, sold over two and a half million copies. But probably the one that he was known most for is in the circle having to do with people who are in the field of sales, because they'd always give it to their fleet or their trainees or um, their team of salespeople, and it was called the greatest salesman in the world. And uh, people loved to experience uh, Agmandino when he came to speak because they had been so impacted by that book, and it spoke to them. And uh, it, it, toward the end of the book, you come to find out that the greatest salesman in the world actually is Jesus Christ. And uh, it's true that Jesus was uh, not only a master teacher, but was a great salesman. And, and he meant that, and I mean that in, with the greatest respect. Uh, he came and sought to sell humanity on what he knew to be the truth about God based on his personal experience. And he didn't come to try and sell himself, you see. It was all about selling the experience with God. And he said things like, I of mine own self can do nothing. Uh, it is the Father within that doeth the works. He said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Interesting. Interesting. He said, the things that I do, you can do also, and even greater things than these, if you believe. And he said, to believe in me is really not to believe in me, but to believe in him who sent me. He made those clear, clear distinctions. So Jesus was selling basically a relationship with the divine, a relationship with God, and the possibilities and the potentials that exist out of that relationship that can become then a reality in your life and part of your experience. He was seeking to inspire a belief that we could also have a first-hand experience of oneness with God, a first-hand experience of, of God moving and expressing through us. And he certainly taught us laws and principles that were important to learn and to live by as well, speaking of you know, how important love was, the greatest commandment, the importance of forgiveness, and, and all of these things. But he said throughout the scriptures things like, you are, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You know, you can be one with God as I am. Matter of fact, he prayed those prayers uh, that we experience the same oneness that he had. You can find them in the scriptures. And so when we buy into those ideas, and I mean really buy them 
and invest in them, there's a shift that happens in our life, really. We cannot remain the same if we really invest in them. Not just buy them and put them on a shelf, but invest in them is a powerful thing. And so many of us along the way um, kind of sell out on really going into the depth of that. And that's part of our journey. Jesus' main selling point, I think, um, and you may differ uh, in that, but I think one of his main selling points was, again, this idea of experiencing God. He said that God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we know that, we were told that the, the spirit of God dwells within us, dwells within all of us. It's waiting to be awakened. It's waiting to be experienced. You know, someone was given a book to read, and it was a book uh, about all the spiritual laws and principles that lead to a happy and successful life and it was contained in the book. And after reading the book, a person said, I read the book and nothing happened. I read the book and nothing happened. <laughs> it's more than just reading the book, right? It's kind of like reading a cookbook doesn't make a person a good cook. <laughs> I know it wouldn't work for me. Uh, so you have to get into the kitchen, you have to start cooking, you have to start experiencing. And, uh, you know, Jesus himself talked a lot about buying and selling. And this whole idea, whole idea. And he talked about buying and selling in relation to the metaphor of the kingdom of heaven. And if you remember, he said that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is within you, is in your midst, okay? And so when he was talking about it just not being a place, but actually a state, so that there are heavenly states you know, and higher states of being that you can move into that allow you to experience dimensions of heaven without having to die. And the old concept is you have to die in order to experience heaven. And that's not true because Jesus himself and many masters and mystics and teachers through time have told us, no, you can actually step into heavenly states, higher states of being in the here and now. You may not be able to maintain and sustain, but you can get a taste uh, for sure, and they sought to teach us because they themselves had gone there. And so we have Jesus really uh, trying to do the same thing. And he said that we are to value, to value those higher states, those heavenly states that are referred to as the kingdom of the, of the mind and heart. And so he said, with a couple of snippet parables that you're familiar, familiar with, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field which when a man found, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Now, keep in mind that many people take that literally and think that you have to sell everything that you have tangibly. It's not what really necessarily is being said. What he's saying is that because everything he talked about had to do with an internal dimension, what he's saying is that everything, what one needs to sell is really all the old ideas, all the limiting concepts, all of these opinions that have pulled you down, held you down, that are not the truth of you. And that's what you have to sell. And now step into another field, a field of possibility, a field of truth, a field of light and love. That's where you're meant to live. And that's what he was talking about. In another parable that was very similar, that you're familiar with too, he talked about the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value, a pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, it's not saying get rid of everything you have. It's just saying that really external things, he was saying, are secondary to the internal. You have to value it. It, has to put, it puts importance on that, uh, that, that sense of heavenly states that you, one can have. And there are degrees of buying. You know, degrees of buying. Uh, there is buying without applying. And, uh, and Jesus talked about that too. And the way he talked about that and made that very clear was in a, a parable that, again, you're all familiar with. It's a very simple parable. It's the parable of the sower and sowing seeds of truth. All right? And so the, uh, the truth and seeds of truth about higher heavenly states called the kingdom are, are, are bought in varying degrees. Okay? So certain things that have value, you need to buy. Certain things that he was offering, he wanted you to buy into and embrace. So some seeds fell along the path, and the birds ate them. And uh, those are the individuals who really never had a clue or, or never grasped for a moment, really, the truth of who they are. 
the seeds of truth. They never had an interest. They never looked that way. That would not fit any of you by any means, unless it fits a certain time in your life. And then certain truth or seeds fell on rocky ground, it had no depth. When the sun came out, it withered. Okay, and so it's the idea that first blush, we love it. Oh, this is great. This is wonderful. We went to this seminar and we're charging out the door. We're going to, you know, really live the life. But it's, we don't have a depth to the soil. And the first problem comes along or we get distracted. Um, basically, it's rocky ground. It doesn't stay with you. There's no depth. And then some fall among thorns. And that's for the person who, you know, they, they, they've learned the truth, but, uh, and they have it, but they just get beaten down by circumstances and situations in life, the thorny things that happen um, that just kind of allow a person to drift away, and it kind of like smothers out that which is the seeds of truth. And then, of course, there's the good soil. And the good soil brings forth a hundredfold. Uh, because one has really embraced it. So in every person, it's saying that there is buried treasure and there is a pearl of great price. But we have to buy the field. You know, we have to own it. We have to invest in it. It has to be important. As he said, it was a pearl of value, of value, and you have to put a value on that. A person must understand that for the believer to come into the kingdom, the kingdom must come into the consciousness of the believer. That's important for you to get that. I'm going to say that again. For the believer to come into the kingdom, the kingdom must come into the consciousness of the believer. Some of you are familiar with a movie that was one of my favorites. It wasn't that long ago. I don't think, I, I don't even know how long ago it was, but the movie was Seabiscuit. And uh, many of you probably saw the movie, and if you didn't, you ought to go rent it. And even if you saw it, you ought to go rent it and see it again, because it's a great, great movie about a, a horse that became very successful and famous and and actually, it's a story about hidden treasure. If you look at that story, there, everywhere there's hidden treasure and, and the, it emerging, that, that buried treasure coming to the surface. There's a horse that had, had been given up on by, by everyone, didn't look big, didn't look like you could handle it, but kept surprising everyone, given a chance. There was a jockey in the story that was filled with anger. Uh, based on his past and being beaten around by life and the circumstances. There was a trainer who just had not ever found his niche, his opportunity had not come to him. And there was even an owner who was stuck in the sorrows and the feelings of loss and abandonment at that time in his life. And uh, you know, the story just goes on to show that you, know, you can be beaten down, um, but you can't be counted out. And all of those characters came together in a, a really inspiring story uh, to show that you know, we can all discover buried treasure. Uh, within life, within ourselves, it starts there. And uh, I remember when Diane and I went to see the movie, we don't get to see a lot of movies really, but it was, it was very special and memorable to me because I, I loved it and so did all the people. And it, it was a full theater. A lot of times you don't go to a theater and it's a full theater. It's pretty neat when it is full. Um, especially, and it's inspiring, because at the end of the movie, everyone remained seated and, uh, and just applaud with robust. And it was very powerful, because basically, everybody got that that was their story. Everybody got that, you know, there really is buried treasure. There really is a pearl of great price within them, that they were like that horse, and like the jockey, and like the trainer, and like the owner. There was something wanting to be discovered, and celebrated. And it's a great story. And, and we bought it. <laughs> That's why they applaud. You know, there's a, a, a Catherine Hepburn, who was a famous actor. I uh, always enjoyed her. And um, a few years uh, before she passed on, or actually about the last year, I think, prior to her passing on, there was a, a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer that met and interviewed with her and asked her some questions. And, and she was always a person that was, you know, her own person, uh, comfortable in her own skin. And she had um, established some things that she had bought into about life. And it was interesting. I'll just share a few things from the interview, uh, her ideas and beliefs. She was asked about retiring. And she said, actors shouldn't walk away from the audience as long as the audiences aren't walking away from them. As long as people are buying what I'm selling, I'm still selling. And as for those stars who bemoan the hardships of their profession, you know, the impositions, the loss of privacy, it rankled her. Um, she said, these actors who complain in interviews about 12-hour days, you sit there for 11 of them. 
It's not as if you're carrying sacks of feet all day. I love that. She said about those actors who got upset about the press following them, taking away their privacy out of the public, she said, if you don't want to be a public figure, don't pick a public profession. It's that simple. And uh, she believed that actors receive too much attention and respect. She said, let's face it, we're prostitutes. She said, I've been selling myself, my face, my body, the way I walk, the way I talk. And uh, so she was really candid. <laughs> um, and when asked the question, so what do you think it's all about? Life, you know, its purpose, and what we're doing here? Without hesitation, she said, to work hard, to love someone, and to have some fun. And if you're lucky, you keep your health, and somebody loves you back. It was a great answer. And one of the last questions uh, that I share that was in the, that interview, when talking about death, she, she shared this. She said, I don't really believe in heaven and hell, but in the here and now, and that we are meant to live in such a way that we can hope there is always something better than what we currently have. I believe how I act today will affect the way I am tomorrow. And she didn't mean, I think, a heaven and hell in the sense that uh, she just hadn't accepted what had been presented to her in the way of that concept. And I'm not sharing what she had to say as though she's a guru and you should accept everything she says. You shouldn't accept necessarily everything I say. Okay, I'd like you to maybe, but put some things on a shelf. Think it through. You know, do you buy this from Howard or not? You know, it's okay. That's the process. Uh, so every day, every day, of life, there is something on sale. Every day, life itself is on sale. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. He also said, you know, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth consume, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, you know. And what he's talking about is heavenly states of the mind and heart, the internal. So every day, love goes on sale. Every day, peace goes on sale. Every day, a sense of joy goes on sale. Every day, kindness goes on sale. Every day, praise goes on sale. Every day, some form of goodness goes on sale. And you have to ask yourself, you know, have you bought? Are you living it? You know, Jesus said, that, uh, Jesus, who was the greatest salesman in the world, according to Agmandino, and I would agree, he said basically that we're all children of God. He said we're the salt of the earth. He said that we're a light in the world. And it comes down to it, can you buy it? Can you buy it? Will you buy it? From the book, The Salesman, Greatest Salesman in the World, a key character, pray to prayer at the end. And the, one of the last lines of the prayer goes, let me become all you planned for me when my seed was planted and selected by you to sprout in the vineyard of the world. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. At Unity, we believe that God's presence of love and goodness is everywhere and that life is meant to be good. You can find out more about Unity and our teachings at unityhouston.org.